go. All right, maybe we're okay after all. Let's see. It's alive. Okay. Ah, okay, great. So, um, I think Professor Who went through a little bit of this possibly, but um, may, did he go through this example? Does this look familiar? Yes, no? Okay, I'm going to guess no then. So, okay. So did, I mean, did he talk about, let me make sure, maybe he told me the wrong thing. <laughs> Is this so small? Okay. So does does any of this look from familiar? Okay, okay, good. So do you get through this stuff? Okay. Uh, did you talk about back propagation at all? No. Ah, okay. So maybe. What's not? Okay, this. Okay. So I think he told me. He told me that he had gone through this with you, but it sounds like maybe that's not true. That's okay. Doesn't really matter. We can get through it. So. Did we talk about this anatomy of a convolution layer? Yes. Okay. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. Sorry, let me let me refresh my memory. It's been six months since I taught this. <laughs> uh, and I haven't been doing it for thirty years, so it's just not just right there. Okay, so maybe we can start here. Oh, I wonder if I'm supposed to present to Chicago, too. <laughs> that sounds like a thing. Yeah, well, they're not the only ones. <laughs> What's going on? We've been abandoned. I don't even know how this thing really works. Hmm. Am I signed in? That's good. Courses. No, that's not it. So, looks like I'm here, but I'm not set up for this class somehow. Well, you know, if we do what we can, I suppose. Mm -hmm. Oh, this looks right. Okay. So maybe here. Maybe. What day is it today? March something? Oh, so am I already presenting somehow? What is this doing? Okay, cool. Let's see. What's going on here? <laughs> Let's see what they see. Okay. So that's something. So now, what if we do this? Okay, maybe this is the right thing to do. Okay. Well, hopefully they were persistent enough to s sit around in that room and wait for us here. If not, maybe I can give them a lecture some other time. <laughs> <laughs> 
That sounds like my fault. Okay, so we talked about some of this stuff, but we're going to start here. Okay, so just as a quick refresher then, I wonder if my microphone is on. Um, so we have a convolution layer, and we take uh, some number of input channels. And so, for example, uh, in our project, we might have some of our layer, our first convolution layer that looks at the input image might have a single input channel because the image is grayscale. Um, but we might do convolution on an RGB image, say, that has three channels. So, you know, the number of input channels that we have in the convolution layer um, could, depends on where, what the inputs are and where it falls in the network architecture. Um, and then the convolution layer has a certain number of filters. Uh, and this captures sort of the different, how many different kinds of features and parameters that we want the convolution layer to be able to have. And so it has one filter, uh, it has a number of filter kernels equal to uh, the, the product of the number of input and output layers. And so the way this works is that, right, we can see here that if we have three output layers, for each output layer, we have one convolution kernel per input layer, and those kernels are applied separately to the input layers, and their results are summed up. And so, you know, you could imagine this, for example, if we had a convolution layer that was trying to detect something in the red channel of the image, uh, we're, we want to have maybe a separate convolution filter for each input channel of the image because then the network can learn that the weights in the convolution kernels that are applied to the green and the blue channel uh, should be zero or should be ignored in some way uh, because all of the training data sort of points to features that we only collect from the red layer. Um, but then the reason that we need multiple kernels for each output channel is that uh, each output channel may be learning a different set of features from the input layer. So, right, we might have one output channel that has high activation on, you know, upper left-hand corners of boxes and another convolution channel that has high activation um, for patterns that are circular or something like that. So. We have these number of filters to take different aspects of the inputs and produce different possible aspects at the output. Um, and so in the course project, uh, you're, you have a convolution layer that you need to implement, um, but it's used twice in the network. Uh, and so the number of input channels and output channels at each of those points in the network is different, but you are writing you know, one generic implementation. So when you're optimizing your code, you're going to want to pay attention to, you know, you don't necessarily want to optimize too far for one particular size because you still have to run on the other uh, network, per, ne network dimensions. Um, I'm not going to, in the project, create a new network architecture. So actually, you can specialize your convolutional layer to just the parameters that you see. Um, so for example, you could say, you know, if my input layer and output, number of input and output channels are within these ranges, I want to use this kernel. And if they're within these ranges, I want to use this kernel or something like that, right? That's totally fine. Uh, you can do something like that if you'd like. Or you can try to make one that's good for everything. Uh, I don't really know exactly. I mean, I suspect the first approach would probably end up being better. But it's also you know, a little more work in debugging. So I'll leave that up to you. Um, but of course, right, the, the dimensions or the extent of each of the output channels is smaller than the input channel in most cases. Uh, because well, in these convolutional networks, typically we don't really deal with ghost cells, right? Because in some sense, that's just kind of injecting made up values into our data. And so it just makes the training process a little bit harder to converge because there's nonsense data that we're injecting in for no particular reason. So typically, we'll just um, we'll only apply the convolution to the actual input space, and so our output size will be somewhat reduced. Um, and so there's another kind of layer that's typically associated with convolution layers, and actually the project does this, but you don't have to implement this. Um, but it's called a pooling layer, and so this is a way to do subsampling on the input. Uh, and so usually, you know, we're trying to produce uh, we, we want to sort of reduce the size of the channels before we apply the next convolution layer. 
Um, typically because there's all, this will reduce the amount of weights in the network, which makes the computation faster. And in a lot of cases, these networks tend to have more weights and parameters than we maybe really need. Uh, if we were to just use convolution layers to kind of reduce the size of the network, we'd end up with all these sort of extraneous parameters uh, where it would be too easy to overtrain or take too long. So we have something called a pooling layer. And so you could even imagine a pooling layer. There's a variety of different kinds, but it's going to produce an output channel that's, say, half the size of the input channel in each dimension. And so you could imagine it could do that by just sampling every other pixel in the input. Or you could take the maximum pixel in a window and output it. Or you could do the average. Or you could do a median. So it kind of depends on your um, uh, what problem you're trying to solve. Um, but the nice thing about these is that you can imagine that um, it helps make the representation somewhat invariant to small translations in the input, right? Because if I'm taking an input window and using a single value to summarize it, say I'm taking the max value in that input window as my summary value. If I shift my input window a little bit, the max value will probably be the same, right? So uh, it helps make the network uh, invariant to these small translations, uh, which makes it more robust in practice as well. And so our layer or our network architecture for the project does use uh, one or two one or two pooling layers, but you don't you don't have to implement that. Uh, we are we do kind of cover it a little bit in this class just because they're so commonly tied with convolution. Um, but you could uh, okay yeah, so does that does that make some sense? Um, and so whenever if you recall back to the fully connected layers, uh, we had this notion of a bias and um, some nonlinearity. And so oftentimes in practice, um, we could sort of fuse the bias or nonlinearity with one of our other layers. So instead of you know, running, running a convolution where we read from global memory, do some work probably in shared memory, and then write back out to global memory, and then calling another kernel where we read the values uh, and you know, just like add some constant to them and write it back out, um, we could not do one of those stores and loads to global memory by just saying, you know, we do the convolution. And then before we produce our summary value and write it back to global memory, we'll just add the bias to it, right? So it'd be very common to just fuse some of these operations whenever possible. And of course, you can imagine during your convolution layer, it might be very easy to also fuse a pooling at the end of that convolution, right? Everyone does their value, and then you have you know, maybe a thread block look at a chunk of output values and create a single summary value, the maximum value, uh, prevent, prevent extra loads and stores to global memory. So things like that. So we may decide to fuse this, but conceptually, I mean, that's an implementation choice. So conceptually, it doesn't, it doesn't really change uh, the, net, the architecture of the network or anything like that. Um, so the reason that we do convolutions at all uh, as opposed to just always using a fully connected layer, right? In a fully connected layer, every single element of the output channel could be impacted by every single element of the input channel. And in a convolution, that's not true, right? And so it seems like we're losing some descriptive power uh, in our network, right? There might be some important connection uh, between an input element and an output element that we miss just because our convolution window is small. And that is true. Uh, but in practice, a lot of times, if we're looking for patterns in input data or we're trying to recognize objects, it's uh, the nearby input values that have the meaningful correlations, right? Um, the fact that two pixels make up a circle, uh, you don't need to know anything about faraway pixels to know whether two nearby pixels are part of the same small circle, for example. And so, by adding in, if we just used fully connected layers all the time, we would have all of these extra parameters that probably were meaningless, and yet we would have to train to learn that they were meaningless. Whereas in, if we just use convolution kernel instead of a fully connected layer, we're sort of implicitly setting most of the connections between the inputs and the outputs to zero. And uh, that's probably fine, because probably they were zero anyway. Um, and you know, so this has many nice consequences. It's much faster to train because there's just less work that you have to do. Uh, there's less data that you have to store. Um, the downside is that if you do have a scenario where you need this so-called wide receptive field, where 
to know whether a pixel is particularly meaningful, I have to know some information about neighbors that are far away. The only way to do that is to have uh, multiple convolution layers, right? So that's what this diagram here is trying to show, right? If G3 is related to X1, so G3 being in the top and the center, and X1 being on your left, uh, then we, if we have these convolution kernels that have radius 3, which is what we have here, right, we need two layers so that information from X1 can reach G3. Right? Whereas if this was a fully connected layer, we could throw out that middle layer, and all of the Gs would just be connected to all of the Xs. And so then we could potentially capture that meaningful connection with one convolute, or one fully connected layer. So a little pros and cons here. Um, but you know, convolution networks have become extremely powerful um, uh, for image recognition tasks because there's not very many long-range interactions. So another nice thing about this is that um, the convolution kernel is reused many, many times when we produce the output, right? So the two separate locations that we have in the input channel, two separate windows, the same convolution layer is used uh, to produce two separate locations in the output channel. And in a fully connected layer, we have separate weights, an individual separate weight connecting every input to every output. And so there's not any reuse in that sense. Um, and so, as Professor Hu, I'm sure, has impressed upon you, you know, one of our tools in our high-performance tool bag is really taking advantage of data reuse to avoid um, the global memory bandwidth bottleneck, right? And so the fact that this data reuse is kind of built into the convolution kernel makes it particularly appropriate for uh, GPUs. Uh, and so we noticed this on the convolution MP as well. Right, so we can everyone can load the kernel into shared memory or something along these lines, uh, and um, we just get to reuse that kernel everywhere. We, I mean, we may not have even really thought about how great of an advantage that was uh, when we were writing it. Um, and the final thing, uh, and this is more, this is sort of a consequence of this convolution, uh, is that right, if the input is translated uh, in any particular way, the output is also translated in that way. Um, and so we get this nice map of where in our input the features that we care about are in our output. Uh, and so that can help to localize where objects are and things like that. So really, this is a pretty nifty thing. Um, and that's why we're using it for the course project, because it's, it's widely used. I mean, we mostly talk about it in the context of images. But for example, uh, I'm working with some code on Blue Waters, so the supercomputer here. Uh, there's some teams that are using Blue Waters to analyze the LIGO data. So they're the team that was looking for those gravitational, like the gravitational waves that come from black holes that are colliding or orbiting each other or something along these lines. And they use convolutional neural networks uh, to detect, to look at that. I mean, you could imagine it uh, sort of simply as a bunch of time series data of like the strength of the gravitational field. And so they can use a set of 1D convolutions to look at this. So I mean, we talk about it in the context of images, but you could do it for sounds or anything else like that as well. Um, and so yeah. Uh, and they use that to try to detect whether any not noteworthy events have happened. So the sign, because they get a bunch of data, and they can't really have everyone look at all the data. So they have this network trained to identify when they think something noteworthy is happening, so they can go in and look at it. Um, and so just to, just to sort of summarize this difference between the convolution and fully connected layer, um, you know, when we have a convolution, we're working on, in, the, in our typical case, a, a, 2D, a 2D matrix of right, input values. And our operation is you know, the weight matrix convolved with the input matrix. Um, and the kernel is smaller than the input, which means there's a smaller receptive field, but fewer weights. So it's just both, both of those. It's kind of two, two ways of saying the same thing. Um, so in a fully connected layer, right, we have this dot product. Um, uh, so we're doing, or sorry, dense matrix vector multiplication uh, to produce the output. And we have the maximum receptive field, but the size of the weight matrix is much, much larger than the size of the convolution filter. That's the trade-off. And actually, I guess I should point out that often in a convolution, we would have a bias as well, um, you know, for the same reason that we would have it in a fully connected layer. Uh, it's, it's more useful descriptive power at the cost of not that many more network parameters. Um, so 
So the main operation um, that there's two kinds of operations that we talk about in neural network architectures. So we have forward propagation and backward propagation. And so for our project, we're doing forward propagation or the inference pass. Uh, and so in this case, that's where we take the input features and apply the weight matrix. So we just do the conv all the convolutions that we're supposed to do to produce all of the output features. And so, right, you're making that green box, the convolutional layer in your project. It's going to take some four-dimensional input data. Uh, so, you know, um, the input will be like the number of channels, the batch size, and the dimensions of the channel, uh, and produce some four-dimensional output by doing convolutions. And so, how legible is this? Somewhat legible. And so, you know, I mean, we've all done a convolution before, but, um, and I'll step through this in the next set of slides. That was the first thing I was asking you guys whether you had done or not, whether we had gone over or not. Um, but just to make sure this is really clear for everyone, so say on the bottom we have these three by three inputs. And so we could imagine this as uh, three channels of a, three color channels of an image. And then we're, our convolutions here, say, are two by two. And so uh, when we map those convolutions over the input, we have sort of four separate locations that we can, we can do. And so then our outputs become you know, two by two, so the four locations. And so uh, you know, it's just your standard convolution. So um, looking at the lower left, uh, we have you know, we're, try we're producing this value of 14 by taking uh, that leftmost convolution filter and the leftmost input. So that's, uh, you know, 1 times 1 plus 1 times 2 plus 2 times 1 plus 2 times 1. Uh, and then we're also, to produce the 14, though, we're adding in the corresponding convolutions with each input channel. And so we'll go through this in a little more detail in the next stack of slides. Um, but, yeah. Where we're at. And then so we have a separate set of convolution filters for the second output feature. So we have three convolution filters for the leftmost output because we have three inputs and we have three, three additional convolution filters to produce a separate set of interesting output features. Um, but those also read from the same three inputs. So we can think of each output feature as sort of learning a different feature of the inputs. And so, so this is the sequential code for the forward layer. And so this is really what you're going to do for milestone two. Uh, you're going to take this code and drop it into the right place in the skeleton code for the project. Um, and it should basically just work for you uh, without too much trouble. Um, there's, there's a little bit of stuff you'll have to write to uh, get the right values out of get the right locations in the Y and the X and the W, because those are passed in in one of MXNet's data formats. So you just have to access the values in the right way. But literally, all we're looking for you to do is you know, take this C code. You don't even really have to modify it if you don't want to, and kind of just drop it in and run it and get the right answer. Um, but you can see, for, so for each image in the batch, um, so we need to operate on all of the images in, our, in, in the batch. Uh, and so when we're operating on the images in the batch, right, if we have 10 images in the batch, that means that in our x, uh, so our input channels, right, you'll notice that the highest order index in the input channel is the batch index. And so right, that's, that's a four-dimensional input there, the, the number of images, the channel, the height, and the width. right. And so there's some channels, height, and width associated with each image in the batch. And then for each image in the batch, we're producing a corresponding output channel for the batch. So the highest order index in the output is also the batch size. So if, for, imagine, if, for example, we were operating on only a single image, uh, you know, B or big B in this case, would just be one. And so then you can see that you know, we're producing a single output, output uh, feature for this input feature, or a single set of output features for this, from this single set of input features on a single image. Um, but in general, we want to expose a little more parallelism by operating on multiple images at once. 
So I mean, it's kind of clear from looking at this that every, the, all the images in each batch are totally parallel, right? We're reading from a separate input region, writing to a separate output region. When we do the sequential code, we loop through them in order, 0 to b minus 1. But in parallel, maybe we wouldn't do that. Um, and so next, uh, you know, we have, to loop, we have to loop over each uh, output feature that we're trying to produce. And so that's you know, the number of feature maps times each pixel in the feature maps. And so that's the next three loops, the m, h, and w. And then to produce each of those, we need to do that convolution filter over the input features. And we loop over all of the convolution kernels in the input feature. And so I want to reemphasize this, that right, we, and you can see from the weight matrix, right, we have this p by q convolution kernel. And then there's one p by q kernel for each of m outputs times c inputs, right? And you can see that from the indexing into w. But there is not, right, we use the same weights on every image in the batch. So we don't have one set of convolution kernels per image in the batch, right? The, co the same convolution is applied to every image. So there's no, there's no b there. Um, so that's, that's, that's how this sort of directly corresponds to that uh, map of the convolution layer uh, I was showing before. Yeah, so does this, does this make some sense? Um, is it clear why we're clearing our output here, right? If we didn't clear our output, we would just be accumulating into some value that was already, that was already there, right? We would, get, we would get the wrong answer most of the time, unless we were extremely lucky. Um, yeah, and so one difference that you're going to have here is these float, uh, the x, w, and y are not just going to be arrays of floating point numbers. They're going to be four-dimensional tensor data structures. Um, but accessing them is pretty simple, and in the skeleton code, you'll see that I show how to do that. So uh, I don't think it should throw anyone for a loop too much. And this data layout as presented here is the same layout as it is in the project. Uh, so that's another thing you could potentially think about is whether you want to you change that. Um, and so this pooling layer is, what is it doing? I think it's taking every kth, I don't know, let me see. <clears throat> yeah, so it's taking, I think it's taking strides of k. Oh, no, it's doing an average. Well, we don't have to implement this, so it doesn't really matter too much. Um, but I guess one thing that I can point out here, yeah, I think it's taking strides of k uh, inputs every pixel to produce the output, maybe. Or maybe averaging by k? Yeah, I'm not sure. Okay, but but one thing to emphasize here is that right, we can produce this uh, summary value. That's what the big S is. But then you know before we write it out, we can do um, add some bias parameter and this nonlinearity if we want. So right, this is an example of how instead of doing another global load from S and then writing this, we can sort of take take this value and apply it. We can apply it before we write it out. Um, yeah. And so the more sort of conceptually challenging idea is this idea of backpropagation. And so when we're doing training of a neural network, uh, I believe we've covered this before, but the basic idea is that we take our input data. We have some training data set where we know for each input, say, um, what, we know what the output is supposed to be. So we have a set of images, and we know which images are cats and dogs. And then we run it through our network, and our network is going to come up with some answer for each image. Um, but we're going to be able to know whether the network did something right or wrong. And so at the very end of the network, we can say, oh, we can put in an error function and say, you know, um, on the first image, your error was 0. You got it right. On the second image, your error was 1. You got it completely wrong. And then the idea is that we need to take that error, 
at the end and push it backwards through the network to figure out how to update all of the weights, so all of the parameters in the network. So the convolution kernel values, the weight matrix in a fully connected layer, uh, the bias values. So these are all the parameters that the network can learn and update them in such a way that the next time we run through the network, our error will go down. Um, and so that's this process of backpropagation. Backpropagation is taking the error. Uh, so that error, in this case, is the DEDY. So DEDY describes how the error changes with respect to the output, if E is our error that we have the input. And we take it through our weights in the convolutional layer, and we change, we say, how the error is affected by the input of our convolutional network. Um, and it'll be, a little, it'll be a little more clear why we need to do this. Um, but basically, we need to have these error gradients surrounding our layers so that we know how to modify uh, the layer parameters themselves. And so, Actually, the implementation for backpropagation is essentially a reverse convolution uh, of the data that's coming in. So it's exactly the same pattern of computation. Uh, Wen Mei was asking me whether we should have you guys do a backward pass for the course project. Uh, and it would be cool for you to do it, but I felt that there was limited educational value because you would literally be writing the same loop pattern with like different variable names twice. And I felt that you wouldn't really get too much out of it, because it's like exactly the same as the convolution, and as the input convolution. And you can see that here. Um, if you compare this slide to the other slide, it's essentially exactly the same pattern. I, even down to right at the very bottom, we have that loop over the input channel, applying the convolution kernel weights to the input channels. Um, Right? We need to do this for every input and every output channel. So it's like exactly the same. Uh, and so I felt that it would be silly to just make you do both implementations. Um, so. But yeah, so, so, this, uh, so this computes the gradient of errors at the input. So this does not update any of the parameters in the network. So uh, I'll talk about that a little bit more, I think, in the next stack of slides. Um, but if, if, we, if you look back to some of the earlier slides where we first talk about backpropagation, you'll see that some of those expressions for the parameter update values, those partial derivative expressions, depend on you know, DEDX and DEDY. Uh, so that's why we need to have those values available. So if you, if you look back at those slides, uh, you'll see that. <coughs> okay. Right. Oh, okay, so we can talk about it a little bit here too, right. And so then once we have these gradients and input features, um, there's some computation to produce um, what the, the update in weights is. So right, this DEDW term literally is how the error function changes with respect to the weight values. And so if you want the error function to go down, all you do is you take the weight values and subtract DEDW from them. That, I mean, does that, that make some sense, I think, right? So uh, it's just gradient descent. Uh, and so that's how we train these networks. So we propagate our error gradient back through all of those derivative expressions. And then we just tweak all of our parameters in the direction that reduces the error. And we do that over and over and over and over again. Um. Right. And so again, uh, this is really the same computation pattern as before. Uh, one difference is that um, DEDW, uh, just like when we were applying the same convolution kernel to all of the inputs to produce all of the outputs, when we're doing backpropagation, all of the input and output errors contribute to the same weight update. Right? Because um, our weight update depends on um, sort of the aggregate properties of our data set, right? We don't just want to learn about a particular subset of our data set. So if, if we only looked at, if we had a, image, a data set that had cats and dogs uh, in it, and we only trained our neural network on the cat images, then it would probably produce random values for the dog images. Um, because our network would see that every image in the data set was 
Actually, it, it might not. So our network might see that every image in the data set was cats. It would learn, oh, I can get full accuracy if I just always report that every image is a cat. And then every time you pass anything in, it will just say it's a cat, because that's what it was trained to do. So what we need to make sure that we do is we're not updating. We don't have a separate weight that we're updating for each image. The same weight is applied to all of the images. And so the error contribution from every image applies to the updated weight matrix. Right, that's sort of a consequence of the normal training process. Um, yeah. How are we doing for time? OK. Uh oh. I closed out of the Chicago students by accident. Oh no. Come back. It was an accident. Yes. Okay. Okay. So this is where we're going to get to go over this uh, in a little more detail, this convolution layer forward path. Uh, so, so we just showed this, right? So basically what we're doing is the number of convolutions that we're doing are equal to the number of input channels times the number of output channels. That's how many convolution kernels we have. So uh, on the left side of the slide, right, I'm sort of reminding which, what domain we're working in here. Um, so right, we're looking at sort of a single image uh, with multiple channels uh, for a particular output channel, right? Because, I mean, there's a huge number of convolutions, right? So I'm taking sort of a small piece of that overall picture. Um, and so we have some particular image in the batch that we're working on. So that's that B index, right? And so when we, we have to index into our input to get that particular image data out, and then we're writing to the corresponding output in Y. So that's on the right-hand side. But right, we have, like I've said a few times, we have only a single set of convolution weights. We don't have separate convolution weights for each image in the batch. So there's no B index in that weight. Right? And so what we're going to do is try to apply. So first we set this thing to 0 so that we can update it. Right? And then we have, for each input channel, so here on the left in the green, the 4 by 4 matrices are the input channels. Uh, and so we have you know, 0, 1, and 2 in the input channel index. And then we have these corresponding, we're, we're, the weights, the convolution weights that we're using correspond to the zeroth output channel. So that's the highest order index. And then we have a separate convolution weight for each input channel. So that's where those three come from. And that's the 0, 1, and 2 in the convolution weight uh, indexing. And then we're producing the zeroth output channel uh, in this example. And so right, first we write that to 0. Uh, and then all we're doing is applying this convolution. So we, we have that top row is 1 times 1 plus 1 times 2 plus 1 times 0. So that's 3. And then that second row is 2 times 1 plus 2 times 1 plus 3 times 3. And that's 13. And then the third row, I think you get the point, it's 2. Um, and so, and then we sum up all those values, right? So that's just the normal convolution. That's a single convolution that we've done. But we have to do this once for each input channel to produce the single output value. So we do the same convolution here, and we're adding 18 plus the next convolution. Um, and then again, we add this. And so the final value is 51 uh, in this particular example. So right, for each input channel, we're doing convolution, and all of the input channels sum to each output channel. So. And so, I mean, th now, so this is highly relevant to the project, right? The parallelism that is available in this convolution layer is what you're going to be exploiting when you do your implementation. And so we've talked about this. I mentioned this already. But all of the, uh, so something that is not on here, first I mentioned, is that all of the images in the batch can be processed in parallel. And so you'll see in your convolution layer that the highest order dimension of those input tensors is going to be more than one. Uh, and so you can work on all of those images at the same time in the same kernel if you like. But the other thing I want to point out is that all of the output feature maps can be calculated in parallel uh, for, each, for each input, right? Um, 
So I wish I had that other diagram up here. But for example, right, this is just the operation that we do for a single output output channel. Right? We have we can imagine taking this little tree that I have and stamping out a second one right next to it. It's just we would be working on output channel one instead of output channel zero. And so the zero that's in that y indexing would become a one. And the zeros on the left side of that w indexing would become ones. Uh, and we just have a totally independent output operation uh, that actually does reuse some of the input data, right? So we can operate all of those outputs in parallel completely. They just read uh, from the, they just all share the same input data. Um, the problem with this is that typically we don't have, you know, a thousand output channels. We'll have like 10 or 50 or something like that. And so just using this parallelism really usually isn't enough to fully utilize the GPU. Um, so, I mean, maybe this is obvious, but I mean, it's good to think about this explicit amount of parallelism. You're already kind of primed to do this because we thought about, because we've done a convolution, we've talked about convolution, but right, each output element in the convolution we also produce in parallel. So that is a huge amount of more parallelism because each of those outputs is going to be, you know, roughly the size of the input. So in our case, say, uh, the input images are 64 by 64. So we might be producing 62 by 62 outputs at the same time, right? And that's a huge amount of parallelism compared to the 50, layer, 50 output channels that we have. Um, and, you know, you can slice and dice this however you want. You could do all the rows in parallel if you find that e doing each pixel in parallel is too parallel. Uh, so that would be like thread coarsening, for example. Um, so this is a big number, but towards the end of the network, right, we're dealing with smaller inputs and smaller outputs because our convolutions and pooling layers have reduced the size of the channels. And so, you know, maybe by the end our layers or our convolutions are only, or our input channels are only five by five, or our output channels are only five by five. And so that's not even close, that's not even the size of a warp, right, if you assigned one output to each pixel. So this is why you potentially want to be a little bit careful when you're writing your implementation. Because you might choose some implementation that makes a lot of sense when the output and input channels are big and you have a lot of threads that you can assign to each of the pixels. But maybe the second time the convolution layer is used in the network, the parameters are wildly different. Maybe there's 10 times as many input and output channels, but the actual convolutions are much smaller. So you just pay attention to the dimensions uh, that your code is running on. Um, and you know, you can put print statements in the host code and like print out the dimensions if you don't know any other way to see what they are, right? So you can do whatever you want. Um, so the other thing is that all of the input feature maps can be processed in parallel, right? So here, right, we're doing three independent convolutions to produce a single value. The only catch is that they're all, the results of those are all accumulated into the final value. And so, um, I don't know how much we've talked about data races and atomic operations yet in this class. Not at all. But the problem is that, uh, so I'm giving you, I guess, a little sneak preview here. Sorry, we, we, we used to talk about this stuff much later in the course, so everything had been covered. So I'll talk to Professor Hu about this. This is a good point. But the problem is that if I have two threads, uh, if they're both trying to uh, add a value to um, a particular output location, the way they actually do that in practice is, right, they load the value at that location from memory into a register. And then they update the value in the register. So they say, I load 0 from memory. I want to add 3 to it. So then there's 0 in my register. I add 3. Now there's 3 in my register. And I write back the value to memory. And so now there's 3 in memory, like they're supposed to be. The problem is that there could be two threads doing that at the same time. So I have two threads that want to load. Uh, that want to add 3 to a value in memory. So they both take a look at the value in memory, which is 0. They both load it into their own register. So they both have 0 in their own register. They both add 3. They both have 3 in our register. And then thread 1 writes 3 back out to memory. And thread 2 writes 3 back out to that memory location. And we've added 3, or we thought we were adding 3 twice to a location in memory. And instead of getting 6, we got 3, because each of the two threads loaded the zero value, added three to it, and wrote three back out. So you have to be careful, and that's exactly what could happen here, right? This first thread could produce 18. The second thread could produce um, whatever it's supposed to be, 13. 
this third thread could produce 20. And then instead of getting 51 out, we, we might get 18 or 13 or 20, or we might get 20 plus 13. Um, and so we have to avoid this by either synchronizing when the threads write to the output. Uh, we could, for example, use a reduction tree to solve this problem, right? So the reduction tree is exactly solving this, right? The reason that we have to do these reduction trees is because we can't just have all the threads load the location in global memory and try to write update all their values into it, right? That doesn't work. So you could do a reduction tree. We haven't talked about atomic operations, um, but you can use atomic operations for this. Atomic operations take that load, update, store, those three operations, and make them one single uninterruptible operation on the memory. So that if three threads try to do, two threads try to do an atomic operation to update memory at the same time, um, it's a serialization point. So if two threads try to do it, one of them will succeed, and the other one will have to wait for the first one to finish before it succeeds. So there's some kind of nice tools to do this. We'll talk about atomic operations in a little more detail later and the performance considerations. But so you could do reduction tree, you could do atomics, but you have to do something to take care of that case. But that's a that's a good amount of parallelism too there available in the input map. So it's probably worth it's probably worth tackling. Um, and so we can talk about a basic kernel design to kind of motivate this. And so the idea that we're going to have is each block is going to produce a slice of the output pixels. Okay, so just a tile of the output pixels, just like we might have in. Uh, if we had like this normal convolution or the matrix matrix operations, right? We have a block of threads and they each produce some part of the product matrix, right? So it's conceptually the same. We'll have some threads and they'll produce a slice of the output. Um, but what we're going to do is we're going to mix this up a little bit. So in the matrix multiplication, we assigned the x dimension of the threads to the x dimension of the output matrix and the y dimension of the threads to the y dimension of the output matrix. And so you may not have thought about this at the time. It was relatively early in the course, but there was no particular reason that we had to do that, right? Um, so the trivial case would be we could assign, if we're doing a matrix multiplication on the CPU, we would assign one thread to all of the output locations, right? Or in our CUDA code, we could have rewritten it so that we assigned the y threads to the x dimension of the output and the x threads to the y dimension of the output. That uh, would probably just serve to confuse people who are like, you know, peer reviewing your code or something. Uh, but you could have done it. You could have um, assigned x threads to x dimensions, but had each thread work on two of the outputs that were next to each other. And so you would launch half as many x threads as the x dimension of the product matrix. So you could have done all of these things. Uh, and you would have gotten the right answer on WebGPU when you submitted it. Right? We're not checking for that. Those are all totally legitimate implementations. So we're going to make a decision here, right? In, our, in CUDA, uh, we only have three dimensions of you know, thread ID and block ID. So NVIDIA did not see fit to provide us with arbitrary grid and block dimensions. And so we only have three to work with. And so what we're going to do is we have many more, we have four dimensions in our output, right? Right, those four, those four spots. So we can't, unfortunately, just assign naively you know, x to the x of the output, y to the y of the output, z to the output channel of the output, because then what do we do with the batches? So instead, what we're going to do is we're going to assign the x dimension of the grid to the number of output feature maps and the y dimension of the grid to the number of tiles that we want in the output feature map. Um, and so this is a totally arbitrary mapping. Right? You could have swapped x and y here, and it would still work. It would just change what indexes you used in your code. And I'll, I'll, have, a, I'll have a little diagram of this. So uh, bear with me for a second if you're, if you're a little bit confused, and hopefully we'll be able to sort it out. Um, and so right, we kind of have these same variables, w out and h out, uh, as in the previous examples, are the output feature map width and height. So that's the. In this case, that would be two for both of them. Oops. Um, and so, you know, our grid dimension is, we're cutting a few corners here, right? So um, this will only work properly if w out and h out are a multiple of tile width, but you could, uh, you know, 
do convert them to floats and do the ceiling or whatever. That many people have run into this problem at least once in this class. Um, and then, so we have a number of grid, the, the size of the grid that we're trying to produce, right, is y. So that's the number of grids in the x and y dimension is going to be y. And the number of output channels is m. And so the dimension of our grid is going to be m by y. And then each thread block, right, that's block dim, is going to be working on some 16 by 16 or tile width by tile width set of our outputs. Uh, and then we have this forward convolution curve, right? So we're setting up, setting up our grid. So we have one thread block in the y dimension per output tile. So we have enough thread blocks in the y dimension to cover all of our output tiles, right? And then we have enough thread blocks in the x dimension to cover all of the output channels. So we cover all the tiles in each channel with a thread block, and then all of the channels in the x dimension. So we have enough threads here to do all of the work. The trick is just getting the each thread to do the right work. And so that's, that's often how we can think about decomposing this host code in general. Like figure out what parallelism want to do, figure out how to launch enough threads to cover all that work, and then it's just a matter of, right, that's sort of a separate problem from then writing the thread to do the work that you intend. You can kind of think of it as separation of concerns a little bit, right? So, um, so this is what I'm talking about. So, so unfortunately, we're changing the, some of the dimensions in this just to make it a little more legible. So we have four output feature maps. Uh, and each one is 8 by 8. OK, so we have an 8 by 8 image here. Uh, and so that's the output feature maps and tiles. OK, so we have out by out, or 8 by 8 feature maps, and that's along the bottom of the image. So say we are producing four feature maps. Okay. Um, and then we have output tiles that produce those feature maps. And we're saying those are 4 by 4 in this case. So to cover an 8 by 8 output feature with 4 by 4 tiles, we need four of them. So that's the, uh, the sort of light grid lines on the bottom. Um, and then remember, we said that the uh, we say? <laughs> Sorry, the um, y dimension of our grid is the number of output. Um, we say the y dimension of our grid is the number of tiles in the output feature maps, and so we have eight by eight output feature maps with four by four tiles. So four tiles in the output feature map, uh, and so. Oh, now I've gone and messed up this example. So we're supposed to have four output tile. <clears throat> X dimension of the grid maps the M output feature maps. Oh, okay. So, okay. So the X dimension of our grid here, we have four output feature maps. And so the X dimension of our grid is four, right? So our grid is on the top. The output feature maps are on the bottom. Since we have four feature maps, we have four uh, thread blocks. We have four thread blocks in our grid um, in the x dimension. Uh, and then the y dimension of our grid is to the number of tiles in the output feature maps. And so, in this case, we have. Um, in the y dimension of our grid, we have the number of output features in each map. So that's also four. Uh, and that, that corresponds to the four, four by four grids in our outputs. And so the way that we're going to map this is kind of arbitrary. But we're, so since we have enough thread blocks in our grid to cover all of the blocks in our output, we're going to take the top two, so that's the blue, the upper left uh, two, two thread blocks, and they're going to cover the two uh, top tiles on the, the first output channel, right? And so basically, right, we, in our x dimension of our grid, we have one, uh, we have enough x dimension in our grid to cover each of the output maps. 
So the first column of our grid needs to cover the first output map, and the second column of our grid needs to cover the second output map. And so then we have enough threads, uh, we have enough blocks in the y dimension of our grid to cover all of the tiles in that output map. And so we just need to have each of those thread blocks in our grid cover one of the tiles in our output map. And the way we do that is the first one in the grid is the top left, the second one in the grid is the top right, the third one is the bottom left, and the fourth one is the bottom right. Uh, so that's what this figure that's that's what this figure is trying to show. Um, so it's it's a more complicated mapping of thread blocks to tiles than it than just the direct um, you know x to x and y to y. But that's because our output is higher dimension than the dimensionality that we have available in either the grid or thread or, or thread block dimension in CUDA. So this diagram is just trying to show how we can map um, the thread blocks to the output tiles that we want to produce. Uh, sorry. Um, and so, then all we really have to do for each thread, each thread needs to figure out where its location is in the output feature, or in the output map, uh, and compute the correct indexes to load from the input feature and convolution kernel and just do that particular convolution, right? Because we're, we still have one thread in this example assigned to every output element. And so each thread is basically just doing a single convolution uh, to produce the output. So to produce a single output, right, we have, we have to do a convolution with each of the input channels, right? Just like this. So for each input channel, we do the convolution. So that first loop is we sum over all the input channels, and the second loop is the filter offsets, you know, in the x and y direction. And then all we need to do is load from the right uh, input channel and weight channel or and weight matrix to produce the right output channel. And the output channel index depends on where we are in the x dimension of the grid, right? That's int m is block idx dot x, right? Because the output channel that we're affecting is determined by our x location in the grid. Right? That was the decision we made when we were talking about the host code. Um, and where we are um, within our output tile depends on our location at y in the grid, our thread blocks location. And so those are the next two lines, right? So grid y divided by w uh, says which uh, row of the output we're in, and mod w is which column of the output we're in. Um, and then we add the thread index in to figure out which pixel in that output we're in. And then we just do the convolution. So, so right, it's all, all of the stuff about assigning threads to locations in the output would change m, h, and w. But the actual convolution operation is the same. You just need to make sure you're loading from the right place. Right? So, um, <laughs> so, um, so as long as the total number of pixels in all the output feature maps is big, there's a lot of parallelism here. Because essentially we're creating one thread per output pixel in this example. Um, and typically in the CNN uh, convolutional neural networks, this will be the case. Because uh, as we get fewer, uh, as we get deeper in our network and the layers get smaller, the network the number of output channels typically gets a little bit wider. So this, this works OK. Um, the problem is that each input tile is loaded multiple times, right? One for each block that calculates the output tile. So we can revisit this example, right? To produce this single output, we're loading these three input, uh, these three windows from the input. Um, but to produce output channel one instead of output channel zero, all we're doing is changing, we're not changing where we load from the inputs in this case, right? All we're changing is the zero indexes in the W, uh, the, the highest order index in W, and this, the zero index in Y. So we're reusing the same input data to produce a different output. So that's what we're talking about here is that uh, that th in some sense that's redundantly loaded. It would be great if we could load that once and somehow share it. Right, with all of our threads that are using that input data so we didn't have to load it more than once. Um, so that's that each input tile is loaded multiple times. 
uh, to produce every output tile that requires that input tile. We do a separate load. And so that's not great because we're limited by global memory bandwidth. So we don't want to be we don't want to be doing that if we can avoid it. Um, so we already talked about this a little bit, but you don't have to do this for the project. Um, so how are we doing on time? Um, I'm afraid to start this actually. Yeah, I think it would be a bad idea to start this. I'll just introduce this, uh, and we'll talk about it next time. But sort of the classic trick for this convolution implementation is to do it as a matri dense matrix multiplication instead of a convolution. right? Because we know uh, very good techniques for exploiting data reuse in dense matrix multiplication. right? You learned about the shared memory matrix multiplication. You can get it to be very fast. And there's actually faster implementations that you could consider looking into uh, when, you do, when you do the project. Um, there's something called uh, register tile matrix multiplication that we teach in uh, 508, which I don't know if is being offered uh, next semester. Um, so sort of the follow-up to this course, more like advanced algorithmic techniques. Um, but you can, you can sort of look these up themselves yourself, and they're not too much more complicated than the kind of MPs that you've already been doing. But the basic idea is that a convolution, right, all we're doing is we're taking element-wise elements from the weight matrix and multiplying them by elements from the input and accumulating all of those. And so in some sense, it's very similar to doing a dot product, right, where we take, uh, that's what, and that's what a matrix multiplication is, right, a bunch of dot products. And so we can sort of reformat the convolution weights and inputs so that they take the form of a traditional dense matrix multiplication, and we do dot products. So right to produce that 14, we're doing three dot products, uh, which are the sums of you know, the, the, we can just start with the leftmost weight matrix and input features. Uh, and so that's um, you know, 1 times 1 plus 1 times 2 plus 2 times 1 plus 2 times 1. And so you can see that, we'll talk about how this is done later exactly, but you can see that if we sort of reformat the convolution filters and the input features into this 2 by 12 and 4 by 12 matrix. That first part, the 1, 1, 2, 2, and the top left of the unrolled input features are the parts of a dot product that correspond to that. And then we can sort of map out the corresponding elements and turn it into a dense matrix multiplication. And then it's just a dense matrix multiplication, and you can do Shared memory tiling, you can do whatever techniques that you want to mess with. So it's the same operation, it's just a dense matrix multiplication instead. Uh, and I don't want to stop in the middle of doing that, of this explanation, so we'll talk about it next time probably, um, since it's 1045. And so I don't really have time to do a profiler demo for you either, so I guess I'll do that another time. Um, but, so yes, yeah, so I'm sorry we got started a bit late. Um, but, so we'll talk about both those things in some future class. You have your exams. You don't need to really know anything about the profiling as far as the project is concerned until milestone three. So we're not really putting you behind it all. That's when you're going to start doing your own performance optimizations and describing them. So, yes, sir? Um... I think I'm, I can talk with you a little bit about that after this class. Yeah, I mean, because that's starting to get into shared memory bank conflicts and things that we don't really cover in much detail here. But you mentioned that you want us to do the conditions that are registering. I'm not sure what you're referring to. Oh, yeah, so that, sorry, the shared, or the register tiled shared memory matrix multiplication is not something that you are required to do for the project. It's a faster, more advanced matrix multiplication similar to the shared memory matrix multiplication that you're welcome to look up and investigate sort of on your own uh, during the project. Um, mm -hmm.